which is transbronchial needle aspiration. And lastly, some procedural considerations. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but anyway, uh, the convex probe uh, EBUS scope from Olympus. So as you can see, that there is a convex type transducer, and then of course, uh, which is um, uh, transduces the ultrasound image, and then it's optical system, as you can see here, as well as the needle. So anyway, the channel width is about 2.2 mm, and uh, the outer diameter is about 6.9 mm, and um, it is important to remember that the direction of field is about 35 degrees forward oblique. That's why uh, when you are doing the EBAS scope, uh, you should not see the entire um, lumen that you normally uh, encounter during the flexible bron bronchoscopy. So uh, where can um, the CP EBAS sample? So as you can see, that these are all the mediastinal limb nodes that the EBUS TBNA can sample, as well, which is, uh, covers essentially all the um, lymph nodes that can be sampled via mediastinoscopy. Okay, and then of course, uh, EBUS TBNA can also, besides mediastinoscopy, uh, station one, two, and four can also go into, of course, the hyla, the interloba, as well as the loba lymph nodes. And as you can see, the ones in blue are, uh, for example, the paraesophageal as well as the pulmonary ligament lymph nodes or the paraeotic window can only be either sampled by EUS. And of course, um, aorto pulmonary window probably will need surgical methods. So um, let's just run through a bit about the lymph node anatomy. So as you can see, um, it is very important to know where you are sampling because uh, this will, um, especially in the mediastinal staging for lung cancer, is very important to actually know the boundaries. So of, of, course, just to, um, of course, this session will not be able to uh, run through, but anyway, just remember that on the right side, the borders, the superior and inferior uh, borders of the 4R lymph node actually just an inferior border of the great vessels, usually the veins, right, the brachiocephalic as well as a zygus. Similarly, on the right side, uh, on the left side, you can actually see is all the art arterial things, superior borders, right, of the aorta as well as the pulmonary artery. And of course, there's also very important to note that on axial view, you need to know where the boundaries are for the especially 4L lymph nodes. So let's run through some indications for EBUS TBNA. So the common indications are number one, to diagnose as well as stage uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, number two, uh, median, stinos, uh, I mean median stinal lymphadenopathy of uh, unclear origin. For example, you know, it, can, it can be not infectious as well as inflammatory causes. And of course, uh, endobronchial as well as peribronchial lesions, including mediastinal masses. So we are just going to run through a bit about EBUS TBNA in uh, non-small cell lung cancer diagnosis and staging. So of course, this is a chest document, uh, ACCP guidelines uh, in 2013. So the ACCP guidelines um, classifies uh, the radiographic um, categories of lung cancer into four. So A, B, C, and D. Depending on the actually the extent of uh, mediastinal lymph node involvement, so sorry. So for A, as you can see, it, it means basically mediastinal infiltration. It's a uh, uh, no-brainer. Huh? It's uh, that means that it's obviously uh, involved. Then of course uh, B, uh, you have enlarged lymph nodes, which of course we take as a short axis more than uh, one cm, and then of course there is. Um, normal mediastinal lymph nodes, but the hyla lymph nodes, uh, the N1 lymph nodes are already enlarged, or the uh, tumour is central. So um, in the literature, the definition of central tumour varies, uh, but in this ACCP guidelines, it's within one third of the um, outer, I mean the inner one third of the hemithorax. And lastly, of course, you have a peripheral tumour, right? But actually the normal mediastinal as well as M1 lymph nodes, okay? 
So as you can see, these are the four categories, right? So number one, you have a central tumor with contiguous lymph nodes. You can see that you can't differentiate uh, the tumor from the uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. Okay, and um, B, uh, of course, like I said, there are enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes, and of course, there's some collapse of the right, uh, left upper lobe. And C, you have a mediastin normal mediastinum lymph nodes. The mediastinum lymph nodes are still less than one um, centimeter in short axis. However, uh, there may be a central tumor, right, or uh, the PET may be positive. And D, of course, is a normal mediastinum, all right, and then you have a peripheral tumor. So depending on which category it falls into, A, for A, cases in A, I think it's quite straightforward, right? So um, actually the radiographic assessment should be quite confident, right? That there is mediastinal involvement. But uh, in real life, what we normally do is we just put in an EBAS scope and just sample the tumor, you know, as, as well as the uh, mediastinal lymph node because it's going to be, it's already contiguous, you can't really tell them apart. Okay. And then for B, as you can see, that um, this, you have to sample the mediastinal lymph nodes because they are already enlarged. Sorry. some problem in my view on, on this side. Just give me a while. Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then C, of course, uh, you, you, have, uh, you, you will probably need invasive um, staging of the mediastinum as well because even though the lymph nodes are, are small, uh, it may be PET positive, right? Or there's already involvement of the hyaline limb nodes or the central tumor. And the last is actually quite straightforward. Sorry. And the last is actually quite straightforward. Usually invasive um, mediastinal staging is not required. Okay. So summary of mediastinal staging is, uh, just to put it very simply, number one, you need imaging. Then, of course, uh, in the, like I said, in the interest of time, we won't have time. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, studies going on about the sensitivity as well as the specificity of using CT alone versus PET CT versus uh, CT PET. But in most places nowadays, if available, we do a PET CT together. And that's for imaging, right? However, imaging, like we say, uh, we are not able to stage the mediastinum confidently just by radiographic uh, methods. And therefore, we need some form of invasive sampling. As uh, you can see, I've, you could see, have seen earlier, we usually sample groups B and C, but in real life, we actually sample A, B, and C. And of course, lastly, how do you sample? So, um, like the guidelines have already said, endoscopy over surgical methods, because there's also a lot of literature to say that, you know, uh, EBUS uh, or uh, uh, EUS or combined EUS and EBUS, which are non-invasive methods, are as good or if not better than the traditional surgical methods for sampling. So uh, anyway, this is an article that we published. Uh, so anyway, this is a very rare uh, lung cancer. It's a called a primary pulmonary lymphoepithelioma like carcinoma. Uh, and then in Singapore, and we looked through about 30, 30 over patients uh, in our series. So anyway, just to bring this up is just to say that uh, we use, because this tumor tends to be very centrally located, and uh, we actually compared our experience with uh, EBUS over TBLB as well as uh, TTNA, and we found out actually our EBUS um, yield was 100%. Yeah, so it's actually quite good. So under ultrasound, of course, the convex probe not only can it number one detect the presence of mediastinal lymphadenopathy. You are able to actually um, have some uh, characterizations, and of course, in this field. The Japanese have been very uh, forward uh, in their research as well as uh, investigations. So um, the ultrasound, there are some, we'll go through just some ultrasound as vascular characteristics, okay? And as you can see on, on the screen, right? Sorry. As you can see on the screen, that of course, uh, they look through a few factors. For example, the size, uh, the shape, 
the margin, right? echogenicity, and our presence of a central hyla um, structure, as you can see in this, this thing here, and of course, coagulation necrosis. So, and he found out um, that uh, in this uh, paper uh, that uh, the ultrasound risk factors for malignancy. So, they are just predictive tools, right? So, but they are not um, always true. So, number one, if they are round, they have a distinct margin, right? They have a heterogeneous uh, echogenicity as well as the presence of a coagulation necrosis signs. These are the features that will predict that the lymph node that you are sampling would be more likely to be malignant than benign. And similarly, is a Japanese again, so they have a vascular pattern of classification. So they look at, under Doppler, you can actually uh, use uh, eBus and then you actually uh, do the color flow Doppler. And uh, of course, they graded it into four, uh, four grades, grade zero, uh, grade one, uh, grade two, and grade three. What this means is grade zero, essentially, there's no blood flow. Grade one, there is some vessel, right, that is running towards uh, the hilum. Grade two, you have a bit more, like you have uh, some uh, punctiform, um, uh, what do you call, uh, lesions that you can see. And of course, grade three means that there are a lot of vessels, usually uh, more than four vessels running through the lymph node. And similarly, uh, either you can grade it or you can actually look for this sign called the bronchial artery flow that the Japanese have described. And they found out that it also can predict um, for example, malignancy in a lymph node. And the diagnostic uh, accuracy is about 80% uh, for grade 2 and grade 3, which are the ones on the um, uh, lower end of the diagram. And similarly, the diagnostic accuracy for um, BA flow, which is a bronchial artery flow, is also about 80%. So, but like I said, all these are just uh, predictive um, tools that you can use, uh, while besides using eBus, uh, TVNA just for localization. You can also sort of like have a prediction of uh, the chances of it being malignant. And number two, so we have just gone through some basics uh, as well as uh, mediastinal staging. Uh, why is there a need? And then of course uh, some predictive features of malignancy uh, on ultrasound and vascular characteristics. And now we'll just uh, learn how to stage the mediastinum. So anyway, the mediastinum is always you always stage it from the highest to the lowest. So, so for example, you always sample from N3 to N2 and M1 lymph node. Right? So after sampling, of course, uh, you know you have to uh, get the samples and then you send them for uh, lab processing uh, or on-site um, rows, which is a rapid on-site evaluation. Okay, and then uh, after that, you can also send for cell block. And then, of course, in this day and age, there's a lot of uh, molecular as well as cytogenetic testing that are very important. Similarly, if you have other differential diagnosis that you want to entertain, like for example, infections or even lymphoma, you may want to send for other things such as uh, your infectious studies, right, as well as um, flow cytometry. Okay, and then lastly, we are just going to go through some procedural considerations, uh, which are essentially quite practical. So, of course, not every hospital or institution would have roles. So, we have to decide how many passes, right, in an in a, in a institution that does not uh, routinely uh, perform roles. So, of course, uh, we have, uh, um, of course, um, literature, uh, and this was uh, in chess more than about 10 years ago already. And you can see that uh, the optimal number of aspirations is about three. So at each lymph node station, you should have, have, have at least three. But if uh, the first two aspirations had, has core, core material, core material means that you are, you know, you'll be able to see uh, some um, cellular material, which is a, a, usually an endoscopy nurse will tell you that there is a core. Uh, you can actually stop at two. So, as uh, I have mentioned earlier, so in this day and age, it is criminal <laughs> not to send uh, your eBus uh, TBNA uh, sampling material for molecular profiling. So, uh, as you can see in this um, paper, um, they use a 21 gauge needle, 
which is the Olympus VZ Shot 21, and they perform rows. So for EGFR, you actually need at least 500 tumor cells. Uh, and at least 25% uh, tumor concentration. And of course, uh, for cross mutations, it's actually lower. Uh, and then uh, basically what they found was that uh, about 95% of them were actually, accurate, uh, were actually adequate for molecular profiling. And they performed a median of at least four passes. Four passes. So therefore, as we have uh, discussed earlier. So in the absence of rows, at least three, but I think in this day and age, I think uh, four passes uh, with a minimal uh, 21 gauge needle, you can reliably obtain uh, adequate material for molecular analysis. Okay, then the second practical point. So does the size of the needle matter? So of course, uh, initially we used 22 and after that there was a newer, bigger 21 gauge needle. So anyway, just to tell you, uh, there is no difference in diagnostic U, and then uh, we have um, good evidence from the Japanese again. <laughs> so I think they, there are two Japanese studies uh, that actually evaluated this. And then they actually found that actually there's no difference uh, between the diagnostic U, but just that the bigger needle, although uh, they actually said that um, the architecture was more uh, well um, preserved, right? There was more blood contamination. Huh? So, but with regard to uh, diagnostic U, there is no difference. So the third practical point, so is there a need for rows in the first place? So of course, uh, this is just a sort of like a perspective um, document from uh, the Pulmonary Pathology Society. So of course, we all know that there are potential advantages, right? Or potential advantages will mean that a number of rows, for example, you can ensure that there's adequate uh, assessment of the specimen. It may improve diagnostic U. That is what we think, but in the literature, of course, it's not so. And of course, uh, you can reduce um, additional procedures and um, you can also obtain additional passes for molecular testing and, and, and others. Right? However, the problem with a rose is that you need an experienced cytopathologist on site, right? and sometimes the cost uh, may be an issue. And of course, um, because you need to analyze uh, preliminary uh, sort of uh, cytopath uh, slides, you probably take up more time. So anyway, um, the summary of the document was that, um, the recommendation was that, number one, the roles will help to ensure that the targeted lesion is being sampled and you enable appropriate specimen tr uh, triage because sometimes um, you know, the EBUS may be uh, technically difficult and you may not be able to get a lot of material and therefore you, with, with this rose, you can actually decide which one is actually more important and you send the better materials for, for example, histo uh, rather than uh, microbiology. And it should be used with TBUS, uh, T EBUS tBNA in the diagnosis of lung cancer as it can uh, potentially reduce um, repeat procedures for additional desired testing, for example, molecular studies. Number three, it does not adversely uh, affect the number of aspirations. That means that you actually do not do more aspirations and, the total, and it also doesn't affect the total procedure time or the rate of post-procedural complications. And lastly, it may be helpful in providing a preliminary diagnosis that can uh, reduce the number of additional invasive procedures needed. So to summarize, rows does not, right, whether you have rows or not, it does not affect the diagnostic U of T, uh, EBUS tBNA, but it may reduce the number of aspirations and other procedures. And of course, it may benefit um, physicians because you can actually judge the adequacy of materials for, for example, molecular diagnosis by the bedside. Okay, so the last part, we'll just go through EBUS tBNA technical aspects, and uh, this is, um, is actually the expert panel report uh, published in CHESS about two years ago. So they have beautifully and uh, very concisely summarized for us what are the important things, uh, aspects uh, that we should look out for. So as we can have gone through, the, you, either, you can use moderate or deep sedation, it's graded 2C. The size of the needle, both are uh, okay, and of course uh, you can tissue sampling with or without rows. Yeah, 
Then, of course, we have gone through ultrasound features that can predict uh, malignant and benign diagnosis, right? But that's ungraded. Like I said, it's just a predictive tool, um, but it's not necessary to do. And with or without suction, it's ungraded, right? And of course, in the absence of rows, minimum three passes suggested, right? This is also ungraded. Uh, and of course, like I, uh, we have mentioned earlier, we must get additional samples for molecular diagnosis analysis in this day and age for non-small cell lung cancer. And of course, non-malignant uh, conditions, which can be infectious or, for example, inflammatory or autoimmune, you can actually use T EBAS tbna And the last part is controversial because a suspected lymphoma, but it's ungraded, but they say acceptable initial, right? Then uh, as a um, is actually as acceptable as an initial, minimally invasive diagnostic procedure. So we'll end up with this uh, EBAS, TBNA and lymphoma. So there's also some literature uh, um, regarding this. So of course, uh, the authors of this um, paper actually looked through five studies that were about 200 patients. And you, they are all retro retrospective case reviews. Uh, and the problem is with this, with doing this kind of study is that number one, because the, there is a lot of problems uh, because the studies vary from one another, whether it's uh, in terms of procedure protocol, whether it's a new lymphoma versus relapsed lymphoma, and uh, amongst the lymphoma subtypes. The poop diagnostic accuracy was about 70%. And so the, the tricky thing about uh, using EBAS TBNA for the diagnosis of lymphoma is such because number one, definite diagnosis of lymphoma, as we all know, it requires evaluation of number one, cell morphology, immunophenotyping, uh, as well as overall tissue architecture. And in certain kinds of lymphoma, such as hypocellular, marginal zone, as well as for follicular, they may be particularly difficult. And Hodgkin's lymphoma is also very uh, challenging in, um, to diagnose uh, using EBAS tbna As you know, our read uh, Sternberg cells within aspirates are usually very, very hard to find and very hard to see. And evaluation of the overall architecture is often impossible. So, however, um, so the problem as we have already encountered However, of course, there was a subsequent study um, that was published, and then they actually looked at whether there's, is there any difference if it's recurrent uh, or de novo um, lymphoma. But in this study, you, you can actually see that the diagnostic accuracy is very high in this study, I mean, in, in this evaluation. So there's an 88 to 100% for recurrent and then de novo so versus de novo. So, so the author sort of um, suggested that perhaps, you know, in the event uh, that you really need to do uh, EBAS TBNA to diagnose lymphoma, it may be better in a case of relapse, right, over, uh, you know, uh, newly diagnosed, uh, I mean, suspected lymphoma. So, of course, there have been some techniques um, described to improve you for lymphoma. And the, of course, they recommend cytopathologists for rows, uh, flow cytometry, transbronchial needle forceps, right, which uh, actually they make a hole and then after that they introduce the forceps through the hole. Uh, and sometimes surgical methods may be necessary. So um, that's the end of my first talk. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to contact me, you can always uh, contact me via the email. And uh, we have a Sing Health uh, Duke NUS Lung Centre website. So please join us and uh, like our Facebook page. Uh, we often have uh, a lot of um, educational materials, either by uh, local or foreign experts, uh, being uploaded onto the website. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Chúng ta cũng vừa nghe cái bài trình bày của giáo sư uh, Melvin Tay rồi. Uh, sau đây thì chúng ta có hỏi gì không? Ông sẽ có hai cái bài trình bày đúng không? Một phần nữa 